Hi, this is Matt Finch. This is Uncle Matt's D&D Studio, and I'm here with Alyssa Faden, who is uh, well known to a whole bunch of old schoolers um, for being an expert on military history and Romans, and also is well known uh, for as a as a cartographer, and who has done a lot of work, you know, with uh, Whisper and Venom, uh, has done some with Frog God Games, and um, so what we're going to talk about. Uh, well, the first thing is that uh, Alyssa and I share an, in, an enormous range of interests in common, Romans cartography, uh, painting minis, wargaming, but we're going to try and focus uh, on map design. So, um, Alyssa, let's talk about map design. Okay. And, and first of all, point to the bookshelf behind you and talk about what's on it. All right, okay. Well, funny enough, this bookshelf behind me is probably the physical equivalent of everything you've just said. So on the right-hand side over there, um, we've got Arkham Horror on the top. So it's a board game. Uh, I love Call of Cthulhu. I'm, I'm a big Call of Cthulhu role player. Um, but then when we start going down, we've got the uh, second edition Dungeons & Dragons. We get into some Pathfinder. We uh, start getting down into more second edition. Um, and then we've got, I think, a whole bunch of Traveller and Shadowrun. And then at the bottom, we start getting into GURPS and James Bond and actually some of the collectibles. I think I actually have the first edition sealed boxed sets of Dungeons & Dragons um, with the cardboard counters unpunched out because it's still all cellophane wrapped over there. And, and, and you, you, started, you started with D&D in the 80s um, yeah. and, and with Traveller. Uh, as well, presumably, because you once talked about uh, drawing uh, maps of traveler ships when you were in class, like a lot of us did. Um, so what I want to talk about, and you also, you're the DM for your group, right? Uh, yeah, well, uh, so the, the, the thing behind this is, um, you know, I'm the one that was first playing Dungeons & Dragons in my school. It's like no one else played Dungeons & Dragons. And I actually, you know, I have a background in wargaming, and I was at a wargaming club, and there was this other game going on in the corner of the room. Now, you got to imagine there's a whole bunch of grognards there. They've got tape measures out, little tiny miniatures on the tables and stuff, and it's taking five hours to do one move, you know? And all I hear in between moves is, and that was, and that was you was one of the one of the. I was one of the grognards, yeah. and all I hear, all I hear is like, "Ah, oh, you killed my wraith with a plus one dagger," and I'm like, "What are they playing?" And it was Dungeons and Dragons, and I got hooked. I got hooked immediately. I went off. I bought the box set, um, the original red and blue books. Um, and, and, and that, that was that's what and, got me into it. That story right there is sort of the prototypical uh, very first uh, uh, group of of, of D and D players. Uh, actually, I'm going to turn on the lights real quick because I did get lighting for the studio, and so there's no point in not using it. I just suddenly realized my head was totally shadowed. Um, but yeah, that was how, how so many people started really in the first generation was in those wargaming clubs. I mean, that was the same as me. I was playing Napoleonics uh, at that point, and same exact thing, ha people having a ball off in the corner playing D&D. Well, exactly. Um, so, I mean, I go off and I buy the rules, and I've never, I've never read anything like this in my life, right? And I'm, I literally, I remember being in my kitchen and I'm at my mom and dad's kitchen and my dad walks in to get himself a cup of tea or something and I'm, I always remember saying to him dad what is charisma what, what is that <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't understand it. it was so foreign now I played the rules wrong man I played the rules wrong but the point is I was the first kid like in my group to have these rules and so we all got together and we're trying to figure this out and we're going to play it but who's who's the GM? Who's the person that's got the rules? It's me. So that's how I ended. I ended up kind of assuming this GM role, and it was good for me in many ways. I mean, this is a bit of a segue, but it it, it started to boost my confidence. It had me standing up at the head of the table, and now I've got my imagination has got to kick in. I've got to be telling stories, and um, and I think a lot of my public speaking capabilities and confidence and so on and so forth. And honestly, a lot of my knowledge and my interest and my books are all because of that moment of buying the original Dungeons and Dragons and having to entertain a table full of friends now with this um, amazing setting. It's like, yes, take take this book that you've been reading, um, whether it be you know Conan, for example, and now you can be in the world of Conan tell your own stories. And so I've been my, not the only GM, but one of the main GMs for our group ever since. 
All right, jumping from that, and the reason for the pause was I was trying to see if I could mute my microphone. Um, but the uh, so let's get on to to GMing or or DMing from there. Um, that involves designing dungeons a lot. Um, and you and I both write our own stuff, and so let's talk about designing uh, designing dungeons. And before we started the call. Um, I, I said something about traps, and you immediately launched into uh, a philosophy of dungeon design. So how is it that you decide what sort of trap, for example, you're going to put on a map? You know, that's a really good question. Um, so, but let's take a, 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 a small step backwards. And I, I know I'm not the only one in the world that does this, and I'm, I'm not pretending that I am. Uh, I, think, I think we can all sort of stand in a room together and acknowledge that when you've been GMing and writing and designing your own world or your own dungeons and your own settings and your own, let's call it encounters, right? Because that's what it breaks down to um, for your players. And you've been doing it for decades now that you not only need to keep evolving and challenging your players, and sometimes you've got the same players for decades, you want to keep them entertained, right? But you start to ask yourself the question as a GM, and I think you should at some point start to ask the question as a GM, why is this here? And this goes for traps too. I think, I mean, it was like you and I were talking about a little bit earlier. There is, there is the the type of dungeon is a hack and slash dungeon, right? You know, the purpose of the dungeon is is like you know to kill the players or how long can the players survive in this place? And they they're fun, and that's when you get break out your 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 dungeon or your traps book, and it's like a, a thousand and one ways that I can murder my PCs in ways that will have them grimacing at the table. And that's fine. Every single room can be a series of traps. And they've even got little choose your own adventure path ones where they're like that. But there, there comes a point, I think, as a GM and as a designer of your own dungeon where you, you, you start to ask yourself, but why? why? Why is there a rolling ball trap in this dungeon? And can I make it more imaginative? And would it really be here? So I've started to sort of um, really... Think of traps as being part of an encounter. That's how I approach it, Matt. Um, it, it's like, I don't want to just have, um, I mean, a, a pit trap's a pit trap, so that's fine. But I don't want to just have like this false storm when you open it, there's a flame trap behind. What was the point? Is there something else going on here? Is there a hidden treasure room? Is there something else? Who put this trap here? What were they trying to protect against right and so that's where i start to go with my design philosophies i break it right down at the beginning and honestly if you if you take another step backwards it's like what is the purpose of this dungeon and at the end of the day if you go too far with that it's like there's, there's no point to almost any dungeon but let's just assume that this is a tomb this is this is an underground layer this is there is a reason for this uh, uh, being maybe something else moved in uh, after it may have been generations over hundreds of years of different creatures living here that starts to get you into a whole ecosystem and then that starts you making we think about traps and so one of the one of the things too um when you when you mentioned the ecosystem, um, and you had uh, and you had talked about uh, ways to kill the the players, um, really, what I'm, what I'm taking is that there's that there there are two parts there. Um, the The objective is not necessarily, or you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but the the objective is not necessarily to offer a killer dungeon. It's to offer puzzles. Uh, as well as the uh, the encounters that you mentioned. And one of the things specifically about mapping and architecture is that a lot of the time, uh, the puzzle part of it comes from the architecture, like the rolling the rolling ball trap and why would it be there? That's an architectural feature. and how do you how do you run with that sort of thing in terms of puzzles? Yeah, that, that that that's a great point, and that that is the logical next step, right? If you actually start to think about traps as just being a feature of an encounter, um, and it all does break down into an encounter, it's like, how do I make this encounter more interesting than a room with a trap or a room with eight orcs? Uh, you you start to think of well what if what if this is a multi tier thing what if this is actually opening up onto a balcony and down below there's actually a courtyard an indoor courtyard 
then this courtyard could actually be festooned with spider webs and lord knows what's down there while at the top there's actually other creatures too maybe there's this big huge vaulted ceiling and you start to get into i'm going to call it almost like these three dimensions of what the encounter is and you start to marry together not only the physical hazards that have to be overcome this the puzzle let's call it it is a puzzle it's all part of the puzzle right how do i get from here to down there without disturbing the monster that's in here without getting caught up in the webs without you know angering whatever is possibly above me and you have the players thinking about their environment and the trap should be part of that environment you know there was always one encounter i always remember doing i, I love doing i'm going to call it 3d encounters okay so you, i, I love no, i totally i totally agree with that i mean one of the major points that i talk about when i'm talking to people about mapping is using the third dimension have you used the third dimension because if you've just got uh basically a, a flat dungeon you have left out one of the most uh, one of the easiest ways to juice up your dungeon. I mean, even if you have a little, you know, four steps lead up, you know, you're, but, but that's, that's huge. You know, all of a sudden we're, you know, we moved up. There's something, something happened here. Um, and so it's really, uh, you know, if you leave out the third dimension, then now what you're talking about with the third dimension too, um, is your, your, um, You've really got two different concepts going there. One of them is the is the simple third dimension of you know you have this level up here, you have this level down here, spider webs. But you're also talking when you when you talk about the things up above that may be coming down. If that turns into a battle, then you've suddenly also got uh, you've also described a really interesting tactical problem for when a fight starts. So you know that the, you've got both of those two concepts in there. Uh, and that you, you're bang on the mark. You're bang on the mark. I mean, a lot of a lot of games are about the actual fight, right? So, I think the fight can also be in the three dimensions. It doesn't have to be just here's a twenty by twenty room. There's two ogres in there. Go, give me initiative. It can be more interesting than that. Um, it, it, I started thinking about this map when actually I was daydreaming. I was doing a road trip. I'm looking out of the window. I'm looking at the forests of Oregon, and they're thick old forests man and i'm talking about trees that are just a few feet apart and the, the young saplings are mixed in with the older trees and it is difficult terrain i mean it just all of it is difficult terrain but it's not only that but it's it's on that terrain that's like this and you've got these precipices and these overhangs and i'm thinking you wouldn't swing a spear or a two-handed sword in this and that that kind of triggered something in my brain i'm like that the actual environment is part of the combat. And so it doesn't have to be just outdoors, right? When you're indoors, um, whether it be the pillars of the room, the fact that you've got um, a, a big, huge staircase sweeping down into a room below, this staircase becomes part of it. What's down below becomes part of it. The vaulted ceilings, the balconies becomes part of it. Now you're surrounded and you can't get to the pesky little goblins that are 50 feet above you. You know, I love overhangs and bridges and crevices because not only do you have the risk of falling, you could say there's an element of a pit trap. You have this obstacle to be overcome and you have a fight going on that you can't just tackle in your normal roll initiative, rolling me a d20. It's way more than that. The players have to start thinking about it. And part of the reason why I came up with that is I like the group to be involved in this cerebrally sort of thinking about things but also now the magic user has a reason to be casting his magic missiles or his fireballs from the back of the party right because he can get to them up there or now he can be doing his ice bridges now the guy with a bow can actually get in there and play a little bit more because it's not just about the cone and the barbarian at the front running in to smash everything i wanted it to be the type of thing where all of the tool sets are coming into play now the guy that can climb that never gets to use his climbing skill can be shimmying up that slope to try and equalize the combat so and yeah the other, the other thing too about that is that when you have all of those choices available it's not just a matter of somebody doing something that uh, they ordinarily wouldn't get a chance to do it also means that their range of choices is broader uh, than it would be just in a 
flat room. And so you've got um, a, a deeper tactical decision making going on simply because there are now more tools in the tool chest to use in a situation like that. Exactly. Ex exactly. So, and that, 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 I think that starts to elevate your, your plays. It gives them the broader set of responses that they can come up with. Right. And that, that's when you'll have plays sitting there going, Ooh, okay, well, if we did this and this and you go over there and do, and I don't know, it just, it now every single encounter that you're throwing at them, uh, and you could throw in the simpler ones too, that are just, uh, just standard sort of fire. But now, now everyone is kind of engaged on a different, more holistic level and th th so you we started this discussion on traps I've, I've never heard it described as a holistic level but that is a really interesting way of looking at it yeah and th th that i think you know i mean look i mean i'm going to be realistic at the end of the day some of us just want to get down grab a sword and smash some orcs i mean i sure get that. sure Ab absolutely yeah but if you're going to do a year-long campaign and you know, the party is going into, come on, baby boy, the party is coming into the, you know, their third dungeon in like, you know, three months or something. I want it to be different than the last dungeon and different than the dungeon before. I want each dungeon to feel a little bit different, that there was a purpose behind it, that, you know, someone did design and build this with a particular reason, whether that reason has been long lost, but players now identify with the dungeon having a personality. And yeah. that's part of it to me. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right there, having a personality to the dungeon. Now, okay, question that's completely off topic. Um, you do a lot of wargaming, you do a lot of uh, figure painting, uh, terrain, and so, you know, you were working <clears throat> with superglue the other day. Is that the cat that you superglued to the floor? <laughs> No, I, I didn't super glue a cloud to the floor, but I have had super glue all over the place. And yeah, if anyone got it, it would be this little guy right here because he, he gets in everything. In uh, fact, I, this guy's name is Deacon, by the way, after the little kobold. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Okay, so, um, so we covered maps uh, there and the, the sort of holistic component to it. Let me ask you another question. Um, about whether you do something or not. This is something that I do, and I don't know whether other people, other cartographers do it or not. Actually, I can't call myself a cartographer because it sucks, but I'm a really good map designer. Um, and that's part of it, Matt. That is part of it. Map design <laughs> is part of it. It is. Yeah. Um, okay, so, but here's the question, okay, in the, especially in the old school dungeons where you had the long corridors and a lot of times the floor plan didn't make sense uh, in terms of what you would design for a dungeon, I think it made excellent sense in terms of designing, call it a game board for what was going on, because what you could do is you could, um, you could look at, uh, a, a, a small number of rooms together and these corridors and actually the combat was not necessarily limited to the one room uh, in which you would encounter those two uh, ogres. You might actually use a larger piece of the map as your tactical ground where you're fighting and use the sort of we're going to run around and surround uh, people we're going to run back and form a trap or uh, on the other hand oh my god there are goblins behind us now um, is do you do you think of um, tactical chunks like that when you're designing yeah um, yeah I do uh, you know I, I mentioned the the concept before of like have uh, sort of breaking down everything into encounters and i don't think that uh, necessarily an encounter is a room or a number on a map uh, the encounter can be this set of areas this related set of areas um whether it be related by the proximity of monsters or creatures or potential sort of mini encounters in that way um traps but also the actual sort of layout of the rooms that you like you're referring to because like you say if you've got a a series of rooms and they effectively do a circle then 
you not only do you have the threat potentially in front of you, but you have the threat potentially behind you or off to one side. And that too becomes part of that more holistic environment that the players have to not only be aware of, but potentially influence to their advantage, right? And, and when you talk about them uh, being aware uh, of it, that adds to an, another um, aspect of what's often considered the old school style of gaming, which is uh, that all of a sudden reconnaissance has a value to it. And oh, if, yeah, you are, yeah. if you're just doing a, a series of, of fights, then reconnaissance is really not a big deal because you're just going to run into it when you run into it. But if you uh, if you want to get an idea of the pattern of the corridors so that you can either get out or surround uh, rather than being blocked off or surrounded yourself, then it's worthwhile uh, to do a sort of low violence you know, run through and get a picture of the area. We see, and that, that, that sort of get, starts to get into, uh, you know, one of the ways that I actually like to ap uh, approach my design of my dungeons um, is I actually look at my player characters and I look towards what skills they've taken and the non usual skills that I actually want them to be able to use more. So, for example, if I know that someone in the party has just put a stack of points in swim. Um, so we're talking Pathfinder here for the most part, right? Right, but I mean, you know, it could be Rune Quest, and he's he's, he's like strutting around with like seventy five percent swim skill. It's like, well, that that's cool, but you know, we're in the middle of a desert. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how often he's going to get to use that. As a GM and a designer, what I'd like to try and do occasionally is say, okay, I'm going to put a water encounter in here. I'm going to have a flooded tunnel. So now you have this tunnel that goes to or maybe towards a dead end. It could be an underground water system or whatever. And there's water there, there's a pool. But it's not just a pool, it goes somewhere and it comes up somewhere else into maybe another cave or something. And that starts to get into the reconnaissance. What is up there? Because you're not going to get the guy in armor stripping off his armor and just going like, what, hundreds of feet? I don't know how long this goes. We've got to recon this area. So yeah, and also you could do the whole thing going down too, whether it be shafts going down. I want to remember that I did a, a series of, each room was basically a cube. And it was almost like, just imagine a three by three stack of rooms all stacked on each other. So you not only had the left and right, you had the up and down aspect of it too. I had trap doors in the floors and the ceilings. And of course you got doors in all of the walls. And the, there was a creature in there with them. And it's moving around inside this series. And I think it was more like four by four. And the oh no, the aliens, the aliens <laughs> are in the air duct. <laughs> right, and it's like, well, are we going up? Are we going out? Are we going down? And the party really had to start thinking about how they were going to track where they were in this, how they were going to recon this thing, and how they were not going to have this thing coming up behind them. And the, that was great, like threatening their, their flank and their rear continually and having them sort of think, well, it could be coming from any direction. It is the aliens sort of situation, right? So, yeah, I'd like to, and that goes back into the three dimensions, you know, have the party thinking about what's below them and what's above them, you know, and what's around them as much as you can. Now, okay, here's another question. Um... I think I probably know the answer to this one. Actually, I'm sorry, my hands my hands are half covered in uh, uh, black paint because I've I've been uh, washing terrain. Um, so yeah, terrain today is terrain day. So I've got I've got you know wood glue all over me and plaster dust all over me because I'm doing dungeon walls. Um, okay, the question um, was this. I've forgotten it, but um, okay. Do you, well, first of all, I guess the question is, do you design big mega dungeons where uh, the goal is for them to keep coming back and doing recon, or do you tend to give them smaller uh, lair type uh, dungeons? I, I, you know, that's, that's a good question. And I don't tend to do the mega dungeons um, where you come back and you come back and you come back. I love the concept, though, I, I do, where, you know, the, the, the campaign, so to speak, is that you're in a city, and the city is just festooned with this network of never ending, you know, layers beneath you. Um, and you never leave the city. You, you, and th that's it. You just keep going deeper and deeper, breaking up into different areas. I love the concept. I don't tend to do it myself, only because my campaigns tend to be more across a country, maybe across a continent. Um, 
each dungeon, each location has, you know, a purpose of why they're there and what they're doing. I might get into one. I did, I did the Hellhound Caves, I called it, where there were something like six layers. Each layer was pretty big, and the party had to go in and come out, go in and come out. I think it was three times, but that's probably as big as I've done. Unfortunately, right at that uh, point in time, my phone rang, uh, and I, it was a call that I had to go ahead and take. So, unfortunately, the, that's where uh, my discussion with Alyssa ended. We decided to go ahead and, and stop it so that I could uh, uh, return the call real quick. But um, rest assured, Alyssa is going to be a recurring guest on the show uh, because that was just a phenomenal uh, discussion covering you know, all sorts of areas. And there's a lot more that I want to talk to her about. So uh, go ahead and, and, and look for her in the future on the show. And uh, so I'll go ahead and end it there by saying that no matter what sort of D&D you play, imagine the hell out of it.